Y'all, it's Pastor Nick. This thing is booting up. So welcome to Sexual Integrity and Restoration. Uh, this is primarily a class that we do on uh, Fridays uh, at the Brig. And uh, because the Brig is uh, quarantined somewhat, um, uh, this information, you know, that we share with the masses in the Brig, um, I felt it was necessary to continue to get this information out to the masses and kind of give you a glimpse into some of the stuff and uh, uh, some of the material and content that we address uh, with the prisoners. Um, basically, in a nutshell, this information, I, I, I categorized it into five categories, um, uh, five sections or five teachings, if you will, but it branches off to so much more. Um, and the conversations that we have in the brig, they're, they're, I learned so much from them and going back and forth, the dialogue. Um, uh, but the five parts I'm referring to when we talk about sex is part one. It's a sex test. We did that on Monday night. If you go through my Facebook timeline, you'll see that uh, under the videos. Um, part one, we talked about the sex test, the inventory. Part two is today. That's sex and our anatomies. And this is all divine design for sex. It's a, it's a divine design uh, approach to sex. Uh, as a matter of fact, when uh, I first had opportunity, I've been teaching on this sex series for almost 20 years now, and I've just been growing and learning and researching and, and finding more and more and getting more revelation. And um, what happened, I started Brig Ministry, just a Bible study, um, back in October of 2000 uh, at the Camp Hansen Brig, and uh, we'd go see the prisoners on a weekly basis. About 2006 or seven. I think 2006, there was a high rate of sexual uh, uh, offensive, offenses being committed and convictions. And the population in the brig, which was about 70, 80 prisoners, um, the population of sexually convicted uh, prisoners was over half, probably 75% of them. <clears throat> so the counselor, the secular counselor there at the brig, what she wanted to do um, she had to develop a curriculum to, to talk about sexual recovery and and uh, healthy viewpoints on sex. And so she took them through her series, which was about four or five weeks, maybe a month. And um, I got word that she was wrapping it up and that she was finished. And I asked her, I did approach her and I asked her, I said, hey, you know, I understand um, you're, you're finished with teaching your, your, your sex classes. So uh, what, what happens now? And she said, uh, well... I'm done. I said, so what happens to the class? She said, well, um, I'm done. And I said, well, do you mind if I take a shot? And so what ends up happening, she got, uh, she got approval from uh, um, her commanding officer for me to come in and uh, uh, told me it was going to be Bible-based, but it would be focused on sex. And we'd have discussions on, about sex and marriage and communication and stuff like this. And um, she was required to be in the classes for the first two or three just to check it out, make sure that I wasn't really out there and um she sat in on the first class and the ceo sat in on the first class and they were blown away by the material and the content and the directness and the truth of it all and uh she even said the brick counselor even said my husband needs to hear this information why haven't i heard of this before probably because you ain't reading your bible and so what ends up happening uh we, we started doing um 2007 2008 i was authorized to do a weekly class and so we started doing a Friday class. So we were doing a Wednesday Bible study and a Friday morning sexual integrity and restoration class. And the conversations that we have in there are rich and they're real. Got to say this about the prisoners. The prisoners, they've already been caught. And because they've already been caught, there's no pretense. There's no guile. It's they're exposed. And I will say this, and I've told the prisoners this, that uh, many of them prisoners are a lot more free and glowing in their relationship with Christ because of that crisis. Um, and because of that exposure, they've had they've been forced to deal with uh, their, their 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 sins. Let's say that. Whereas the majority of Christians I know outside of confinement are still in hiding. You know what I'm talking about. And so I tell the prisoners, you're so much more free than many many Christians that I know who are who are who are in bondage to their sins. And so. And and oh, this the, I, these are the conversations that we have, and it just springboards into all kinds of directions. So that, that's part two, sex and our anatomies. Part three is sex, uh, the effect of sex on our soul. And this is our soul. 
when I asked people to put your finger on your heart, I had people like this. I said, no, the soul, the heart that I'm talking about is this thing right here, your mind. It's your will, your intellect and emotion. This is your soul. I'll get to that in part three. Part four is sex in our spirit, man. What, what does that have to do with anything? That's all. I can teach about that for a whole hour plus some. And then the last one is restoration. How do I get it right? So I call this class SIR, Sexual Integrity and Restoration. So let's just let's just jump into this. There's some things I need to do. Uh, how do I minimize this thing? I got to get you up here. Let's do this. Uh, as I get started, again, we're talking about anatomies today, and uh, the time is going to fly. Um, how many of you remember that movie that came out, the cartoon animated movie, uh, Madagascar? And in that movie, Madagascar, there's some characters in there, and there's um, Gloria. She's one of the main characters. She's a hippo. She's single, and there's a giraffe named Melman, and Melman has a crush on her. And you don't find this out throughout the whole movie. Spoiler alert. I get over it. And then there's uh, uh, Motomoto, and he's another hippo. He's a male hippo. And what ends up happening, uh, as you follow the story, both of them make these approaches towards Gloria the hippo. And uh, Motomoto's first. Or Motomoto approaches her, and the music you know, is playing. And he says, girl, you chunky. Girl, you huge. And he's walking up to B saying, I like them chunky. I like them round. They say I'm funky. They like my sound. And they, they, she's going on. And he's telling her, I like them chunky. And then what ends up happening, Melman take, I mean, uh, Motomoto takes her on a date. And they're at, there they are in, in the pond. And lilies are floating around. Lily pads are floating around. And he's, he's schmoozing her. And the best he can give her is, um, girl, you huge girl, you thick. And she says, yeah, you know, you've said that before. And she says, before this relationship goes any further, I, I need to know what do you like about me? What do you see in me? And he's puzzled. He's befuddled. And he says, uh, I think I already said that, girl, you, you chunky, you huge, you, you girl, you large. And she's like disappointed. And she says, mm, yeah. And about that time, Melman uh, the giraffe comes running up, and he he basically tells her, "Gloria, Gloria, Gloria, I I love you." And he goes on to tell her why he loves her, and and um, or, or why he's attracted to her. And he tells Moto Moto, "Go ahead, and you know she's yours because you're on a date. I don't want to interrupt. But if I were to find someone so so beautiful as her, uh, I would I would find ways to make her laugh. I would uh, bring her orchids, you know, dozens of orchids daily. I would uh, bring her white uh, toast and." with the butter on both sides and then uh, she has the most amazing laugh and I spend my life you know trying to make her laugh and make her happy and he tells Moto Moto so you do that I can't do that you do that and Melman walks away all the female hippos that were underwater they come up out of the water and they're all like ah! and then Gloria's like just her, she's swept away by his words and Melman I mean, uh, Moto Moto is sitting there and he says, um, anyway, where were we? And she looks at him and said, I'm huge. So the point is, when I bring this up and I show this video clip, the point is both of these uh, men were pursuing the girl. And uh, what, was the, what was the primary focus? Moto Moto's focus was on the external. And that, that, that's fine. It has its place. You know, it's an attraction. I, I get it. It's, it's, it's okay. And so, but he was only focused on the external. And, and, and the evidence of that, because all he could do was say, you know, you're huge, you're thick, you're chunky. What was Melman's focus? Melman's focus was on her heart. And the proof in that was because he knew her likes and her dislikes. And he, 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 he knew how to make, he wanted to make her laugh. She likes to laugh. She likes bread this way. She likes orchids this way. And so he paid a lot more uh, attention to her internals, her internal needs. And so that's why I set this up with divine design for sex and his intent for our anatomies. Okay, so let me pray for you guys. So I take time right now, Father, to declare that, Father, that every one of these men and women right now listening and watching, that they know that your will for them is that they should be sanctified by avoiding all sexual immorality. And I declare that these men and women, that they learn how to control and possess their own bodies in a way that is holy and honorable and pleasing to you, Lord. 
Father, I also thank you, Lord, that these men and women know that their bodies are members of Christ himself. Therefore, these men and women, Father, will not take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute. Never. Father, I thank you. These men and women know that whoever unites himself with a prostitute becomes one with her in body. For it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But whoever unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So I declare that these men and women, they flee from sexual immorality because they know that all other sins a person commits are outside of their own bodies. But whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Father, these men of the Holy Spirit who is in them, these men and women are not their own, and they know that they were bought with a price. Therefore, these men and women, Father, they honor you with their bodies. And Father, I thank you that they know that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So each of these men and women run to win because these men and women are disciplined in their training. Father, some want to win a prize that will fade away, but Father, these men and women will run for that eternal prize. And Father, I thank you that they do run with a purpose in every step. These men and women are not just shadow boxing, but they will discipline their bodies like an athlete. They will train their bodies to do what it should. And so Father, I declare that they, these men and women here, they will run hard and they will not be disqualified. Their faith will be proven genuine. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord. These men and women also know that there's a great cloud of witnesses surrounding them that have gone on before them so that these men and women know how to lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles them and, and, and makes them fall. And they put all that aside and they run with endurance the race that was set before them by you. These men and women fix their eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of their faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you need scriptures for that, Throw them at me. Uh, that, that was all scripture. Uh, I'll put it in the comments and I'm, I'll put the prayer out there. That way you can pray pray the word, pray the word, pray the word. So let's get started. So when we start talking about anatomies, you have to start with gen, gen, G-E-N. What does G-E-N mean? A lot of people don't know this. I didn't know this until years ago when I was doing my study and I said, curious, let me click and see what gen means. Gen, G-E-N. It literally means that which produces and we get word like generator generation oxygen hydrogen antigen genocide genesis gene gender genitals and so on and it all comes from that first word gen that which produces so you look at that which produces i have to say this um i'll get to it so let's start with the male sexual organ. Males are born with what's known as a penis. And one of the things that the Bible talks about when it talks about a male sexual organ is, 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 is penis. It talks, it's related to identifying uh, identity and swearing. If you turn to Genesis 24, verse 2. Now I have a lot of scripture here, but I can't turn them all, but I'll quote them. You go look it up yourself. Genesis 24, 2. You'll, you'll probably be familiar with the story here. Um, verse 1, Genesis 24, verse 1, it says, Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Verse 2, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Place your hand under my thigh. Verse 3, And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. Verse 4, But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. And then they go ahead and um, work out the, the, the minutia of, of this promise. But I want you to notice here, um, what he said was, he told his servant, my son is ready. Uh, uh, Abraham says, my son, Isaac, is ready to find a wife. I'm, I'm, swear to me. He says, swear. That was my Batman voice. He says, go to my tribe, my country, my people, and find a wife. But before you go, swear. Put your hand on my thigh. Now, if you study that word out, it's, it's a Hebrew word. It's a euphemism. When, they, when, when, they, when the writers of the King Jimmy wrote this up in many Bibles now, they put a euphemism in place of, of the actual word. Now, what's a euphemism? A euphemism is a way of saying something more palatable, something nice. You know, is to avoid being too crass or vulgar or oh, I'll give you some examples. I've used these often. Instead of saying um, uh, he farted, you say he passed gas. Instead of saying she did, 
you say she passed away. So a euphemism is a, is a nice way of saying something um, crass or something uh, that's uncomfortable. Um, and so he would say, swear to me by placing your hand on my sexual organ. It literally means sexual organ. That word there, thigh, it's supposed to say, put your hand on my sexual organ. Now, what that meant was, because I said um, uh, your, the male penis is directly related with swearing. Right there in Genesis 24, 2, he's saying, put your hand on my thigh and swear to me. Because what a man did back then, he was able to, they understood the value of their sexuality. Whereas today, much of what we do is perverted. We perverted, perverted all this stuff. We perverted love. We per, perverted sex. And, um, um, and so what they would do, they would place their hand over their sexual organ and then make this solemn promise, this solemn oath. And that's what a man would swear by, because he understood the strength. He understood his, 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 his generations, his lineage. He understood this was the greatest thing he could swear by, his manhood. Now, I also want you to know that you're, you're, to a great degree, your sexual organ is related to your identity. And it starts real simply with the moment a child is born, the, the baby comes out of that birthing canal, and that baby is born, what's usually the first pronouncement and declaration over that child. It's congratulations, it's a boy, or congratulations, it's a girl. Based on what? The genitals. Everyone looks at that which produces and says, it's a boy, it's a girl. It's a male, it's a female. Two genders, not complicated. Also, let's take another step. The male sexual organ. It, 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 what does blood and erection have to do with the male sexual organ? Because we're talking about sex here, and we're talking about, you know, we're working up to this thing called sex, and what is it? What was God's design? Well, you know, you cannot have sex unless pre uh, blood is present uh, in, in your sexual organ. Both a, a man, if he does not have blood rushing to a sexual organ, he cannot uh, uh, obtain what's called an erection. I'll get to that in a second. But he has to have blood in his sexual organ and able to penetrate that woman. Now, why is that? Because God knew what he was doing. If you, if you look in Leviticus 17, 11, it says uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. If, if the blood drains out of your body, what do you do? You die. Blood represents life. And so what God says before you commit this act, this act, the sexual act, life must be present. Life will be present. And so blood rushes to that organ. And, and men and women, when they're sexually aroused, blood rushes to both their sexual organs. And it's, it's a way, it's not happenstance. It's very intentional by God. And so when blood rushes into a man's organ, uh, he, he, he achieves what is known, we call it an erection. Now, erection used to be a nice thing. Erection used to be a good thing. It was like something, when something stood erect or when something was erected, you stood back and you admired it. Now, I know a lot of guys today, they stand back and they admire their junk. We've perverted what this, this whole thing about being erect even means. So when, when colossal or great, great, great structures are, 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 are um, completed, what ends up happening? We stand back and we'll, we'll admire, like the Brooklyn Bridge, the Empire State Building, um, or things like that. We'll stand back and we'll look or... or uh, Candlestick Park or, you know, just these stadiums. We'll look back and say, wow, this is amazing. The dome. And we'll look back at this stuff and we'll stand in awe because it's been erected. And a lot of times you'll find out somewhere on there, there's a there's a cornerstone where it says erected on or this was erected on. And so that's just one example of how we respect these things that are erect. Also, did you, did you ever notice, I don't know, I wish they would do this in, in the American theaters, but in the military theaters, um, at least on the Marine bases and in the uh, Air Force bases over here, we go watch the movies, and just as the movie's about to start, the first thing that happens, the, the, the auditorium is full, uh, and there's, there's hundreds of people in there sitting waiting for the movie, and then all of a sudden, the national anthem comes on. It gets immediately quiet, and everyone stands up, and they you know, if you're not in uniform, you place your hand on your heart and you stand there while the national anthem plays. It, it's really a beautiful thing to watch. Now, why are we standing up? Why are we erect? It's a sign of respect. Also, when a judge enters a courtroom, if you've ever been to court, 
and the judge is in the courtroom and the bailiff says, all rise. Why does everyone rise? It's to re it's, a, it's a sign of respect. That's what, this is what an erection was supposed to mean. It was a sign of respect. And what about when, um, here's a big one. What about when uh, your, your, your bride, the whole church is waiting for the bride to come down the aisle. Here comes the bride. And what does everyone do? Everyone stands erect. It's to honor, it's to respect. And so this is what this is all about, this, this erection thing. Now, there's also, when we talk about the male sexual organ, there's this thing called circumcision and covenant. Now, if you read Genesis 17, uh, this is where God pulls Abram aside and says, Abram, we're going to do a new thing. We're going to do a, a new thing. And I was like, what? what? A new thing? What are you talking about? Well, if you read the story in Genesis 17, what you find out, God says, um, we're, we're, we're starting a new chapter here. There's this thing called circumcision. And God says, I want you to dedicate that to me. God says, I want that. And he's pointing to the man's sexual organ. How do I know this? Because what circumcision means is to, to cut away the foreskin. You know, men are born with foreskin on their sexual organs. And this is so important to God that he, in this chapter, he says, we're going to do a new thing. And now I, I, I want your sexual organ dedicated to me. Now, why would God say, D dedicate your sexual organ to me? Why would he say that? Because he could have said, I, I, I want your feet. I want your hands. I, 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 I want your words. I want your eyes. I want your heart. Right here, God says, no, no, no. I want that. Now, the reason I believe he says this is because he says, if I can get control of that, if we can get that disciplined, then we can control your future, your destiny. This is why I said in Genesis 1, 24, 25, 26, 27, where it talks about, he says, let's create man in our own image and be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. I said this on last week in part one, um, that your ability to have dominion is directly related, directly related to your ability or, or, or the condition of your sexuality being intact. If your sexuality is not intact or is compromised, your ability to have dominion and rule and reign in your own home, in your own, in your own little personal life, it's been compromised. And that's why the importance of this is because this is the only sin in the Bible where God says, run, flee from sexual sins. All other sins, you got to man up and stand up and take it and deal with it. But he gives you permission to leave these because these are these are huge sins. Um, I was thinking about this earlier, and you need to know this. All sex connects you. All sex marries you. I, I, I mean that not in a not in a legal sense, not in a courtroom sense, not even in a ceremonial sense. When you have sex with someone, there's a marriage that occurs. What that means, and see, you know, we, we all agree that God created this institution called marriage. But what, let me ask you something. This institution, and we, we, we kind of gloss right over this and look right over this. This institution that we're talking about, was it, uh, was it a church ceremony? Was it a piece of paper? Or was it... Uh, a, a courthouse marriage. It wasn't any of that. The institution of marriage was when a man and a woman l lay with each other and knew each other intimately and sexually. The two became one. That's what marriage is. Let that sink in, Thaddeus. Let that sink in. This is marriage. And so this is why I'm taking my time with this, because I want you to understand this. You get it, and then you pass it on to somebody else. You get it, you process it, apply it to your life, and give it to someone else. So now there's this thing called, uh, uh, when, I'm, when I was talking about circumcision, you need to understand something. This is very important. When a man is circumcised, or, or the child on the eighth day, when they're circumcised, two things immediately happen. Two things immediately happen, and you understand the first thing a lot of people say, he bleeds first. No, there, there's, there's not bloodshed first. There's a splitting of the flesh first. And so that flesh is split, and then there's bloodshed. And so when God cut covenant with man, it was symbolic. It was, it was, uh, it was when God cut covenant with man, there was a splitting of the flesh and then bleeding. Blood, blood always represents life. So there's an exchange. There's life happening. There's blood. This is why blood is important. You guys ever done this? Blood, compact, uh, blood packs, blood oaths, and things like this? And because it represented life, there's an exchange of life. So number one, when you get cut, there, there, there's a splitting of flesh and bloodshed. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is symbolic of a man having sex with a woman. God cutting covenant with man is symbolic of man cutting covenant with woman through sex. Because what happens, 
a man does the same thing. When he penetrates a woman first, he splits her flesh, and blood is always present, particularly when she's she's a virgin. I'll get to that in a minute, when she's a virgin. But what ends up happening, it's a covenant that's being created right here. Blood is always the price of covenant. Blood is always the price of covenant. If you're going to cut covenant, we're not talking a contract. Contracts are lifeless. They're black and white. Covenants are full of life. And they're full of love. This is why we, we, we have this new covenant with God through Jesus Christ. And by the way, happy Resurrection Sunday coming up. I hope you're celebrating and, 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 and thinking on you know the, this holy week and the things of God and the resurrection. So there's the circumcision and there's the covenant. Here, here's another part. A male sexual organ has this uh, is accompanied by these these two things called testicles. I touched on this on last week during the sex test. Um, testicles, testicles, testicles. What what does that even mean? And I told you that the companion words. Before I tell you what testes, testes and testicles mean, the companion words are testimony, testator, testify, testosterone, testament. They're all related to testes. The root word is testes. T e s t e s. It does not mean test, T-E-S-T-E-S. -E -E that word in Latin literally means to witness, testimony, testify, testicles, witness. So what I'm saying is that your testicles are called witnesses. It's just true. You're, that's why there's two of them. Now, why are they called witnesses, and why are they there? Why didn't God put them right here? Why didn't God put them right here? Because they're supposed to witness the marriage. That's why there's testicles there. Do you ever notice, like in a in a in a, in a uh, what do you call it? Uh, what is it? A drive-by wedding chapel? Uh, you got to have witnesses. In a court wedding, you still have to have witnesses. Uh, in a church ceremony, you got to have witnesses. In just about every society around the world, and they have marriages. A requirement for that marriage to authenticate, to validate it, was witnesses. And so. What, what, where'd they get that idea that witnesses need to be present during this ceremony? Well, they got it from that act of sex because your testicles are witnesses. Now, one of the things I do ask is that if your testicles are witnesses, and number one, what are they supposed to witness? The sacred act of marriage. What have your testicles witnessed? What have they witnessed? Because they bear witness. There's, a, there's so much more to this. Um, I can make a a case for why your testicles are witnesses, why this is important. Here, here's one. Another reason why I believe they're called witnesses is because I don't know people. You could be walking down the street and see hundreds of people walking by you all day long. You may not even know their name, may not know much about them. Um, um, but one thing you have, anytime you see a person without realizing it, one thing you know about that person is somebody had sex. I'm not talking about the person you're watching. I'm talking about that, that that person you're seeing right now, let's say he's 24 years old, you know proof positive that 24 years old, uh, 24 years ago, and say nine months or whatever, there was a moment when there was a sexual act and conception was achieved. That sexual act occurred, and the person standing in front of you right now is is testifying to a sexual act that occurred 24 plus nine months, whatever. 24 years, nine months. I hope that makes sense. So when you see people walking around and you, and you kind of just know that that there was a sexual act that occurred that brought this person to this point in their life today, they're testifying to an act that occurred. Um, so that's there's, there's where testicles are involved. That's I want you to point out in Deuteronomy 23, 1, it, 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 there's a warning there. I'm going to turn there and read that real quick. Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. And I'm reading King James because it's poetic. It says, Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, He that is wounded in the stones or hath his privy member cut off shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. He that is wounded in the stones, that's your testicles, or hath his privy member cut off, that's your sexual organ, your penis, he shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. Now, why? And it goes on. There's so much more sexual stuff in there. It even says a bastard child shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. Uh, it deals all this. Several passages here deal with um, 
they deal with sexuality and be having your sexuality intact. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because what was the point there? How, why is it that someone back then uh, who had either through through a wound in combat um, or, or, or something was wrong with their junk, they were forbidden to enter the congregation of the Lord? Why is that? The point here is, is if your sexuality is not intact, if today, if your sexuality is not intact, um, this principle still applies. It's going to be very difficult for you, for me, to experience the fullness of God. Because sexual, sexuality, sexual sins are, are, are big in the eyes of God. This, this is a big issue. And, and I think I'm laying the groundwork here for proof that God says, no, 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 you've got to get this one right. You've got to get this one right. This is so important. Dedicate that thing to me. Run from this. Because when, if your sex, bottom line, let me just bottom line this: if your sexuality is not intact, it's 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 just going to be so difficult for you and me to experience the fullness of God. It competes with God in our lives. I, I can talk about this; it's a form of idolatry. Then there's this thing called semen. Semen. I'll ask people. Semen and people struggle, they're embarrassed and whatnot. I've had clergy, chaplains, and pastors literally put their fingers in their ears at this point, like, la, 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 I can't believe you said vagina, I can't believe you said penis, I can't believe you said semen. Whatever, man, the world is talking about this stuff and we need to address this stuff directly. So there's this thing called semen, and I ask people what semen is, and just to break it down, and semen is seed. And what what happens with seed? Seed is planted, and once seed is planted, what happens? Something is produced. Well, I'll ask people, because we're talking about sex here, what was God's design for sex? Well, if you study this out, man, semen is related to the anointing. That's a, that's a whole nother, I won't get into this, but it's called shimon. And you study about how, how the oil flowed from the, from, from the hair to the beard, and that was called shimon. And it's the, the word we get is semen here. The Garden of Gethsemane, that literally means Geth, that's a place of squeezing, Semene, semen. I, I'm not going to get into this right now, but I want to bring this back to what, is, what does semen have to do with us today? Because if you read Genesis 38, verses 8 through 10, you'll find out that Onan uh, was supposed to bring forth seed in his brother's name. Uh, his brother's had passed away and left a widow behind. The Hebrew law said that Onan, the youngest brother, had to go into his sister-in-law and bring forth children for his brothers. Well, something went wrong. He didn't approve, and Onan withdrew himself, spilled his semen on the ground. This is Genesis 38, 8, 9, and 10. He spilled his seed on the ground, and in the very next verse, God killed him. God killed him. Your semen is important. So now let me ask you. I've asked, I've taken polls and inventories of people, and I've asked them um, on one climactic ejaculation, one release when a man ejaculates, how much sperm is in one release? People throw out a hundred, they throw out a thousand, ten thousand, one million. It is on average. One release, 180 million to 210 million spermatosum in one puddle of semen. 180 million to 210 million spermatosum. What that means is that this is valuable. The reason why it's valuable when I when 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 they do a man's sperm count and they want to find out, you know, is he shooting blanks? Is he fertile? What's going on here? Um, They'll, they'll count the seed in his puddle of semen and see how much seed he's, he's actually uh, producing and releasing. And then they'll say, this is how potent you are. This is your potency level. Now, why do they use the word potent? What does potent mean? You know, potent, if you build on that word, it means potential. So then when they talk about a man's potential in that puddle of semen, they're saying, how much potential is in 180 million to 210 million possibilities? How much potential is in that? This is why our seed is valuable. Now, uh, when we start talking about this kind of potential, 
you, you need to understand, you know how much 180 million is? That's half the population, almost two thirds of the population of the United States. 50, 60% of the population of the United States. In one puddle of semen, how much potential is in there? And yet here we are abusing it, masturbating, pouring out in the streets, pouring out in a, in a sock and in a towel down the drain. We, we, we don't know the value of our semen. So then there's just know your sexuality is related to your reproduction, your genes, your lineage. And then there's this thing called masturbation. I'm, I'm, I'm got to skip some stuff because I got to get to the female sexual organ. There's a thing called masturbation. And just, just so you know, I, I've got Christians and whatnot. They defend masturbation or they don't Christian leaders and pastors who don't know that they say masturbation is not in the Bible. Yes, it is. Look up flesh. Go to Galatians and look up flesh. Masturbation is flesh. That's you work with that. Go 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 research that and put masturbation in the context of flesh. And the Bible talks about this clearly and abundantly. So where masturbation is concerned, masturbation, the, the original definition of masturbation is manis and stuprare. Manis and stuprare. Manis hand stuprare to defile yourself. So it was called self-abuse. Put those words together it meant to, to abuse yourself to defile yourself with your hand that's the original definition of masturbation look it up uh, today we've perverted it and now the definition you'll be it's going to be difficult for you to find a proper definition research 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 and what you'll find uh modern day translations say it's 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 therapeutic it's recreational it's release it's relief it's 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 harmless no it's not this 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 is this is one of the most deadly things we could do because we're wasting our seed. We're creating habits. I, I know guys now. Oh, I was thinking about this this morning. I know guys personally, many guys who they have this itch. I told you all sex connects. I told you that up front. All sex connects. I don't care what you're doing with your sex. You're connecting to something. Most of our sex is connected to bad stuff. Okay, let's say this is um, this is your wife, and you're supposed to connect fully to her. Well. Before you met her, you connected to all of this stuff. And so now what has to happen, you have to disconnect from all of this and able to connect to her fully. Well, <coughs> excuse me. I know guys today, because they're connected to so much bad stuff, they're connected to so much garbage, that what they'll do, they'll come home and they will argue with their wives. They'll, they'll manufacture an argument just to get mad so they can leave and go do something else. Out of the blue, they'll get frustrated and they'll... I can't take this anymore, whatever, I can't, there's no talking. And they created an argument just so they'll have an, they think they're having an excuse to leave. She knows what you're doing. I'm, I'm telling you right now, if you listen to me and then that one hurt, she knows what you're doing. You're not fooling anyone but yourself. And so, because men get frustrated, yeah, you know, I got to get this release, I got to go do this, and I'm not getting from my wife. All sex connects. And so you're connected to that, and you're running to that. You're not connected to her, you're running from her. As a matter of fact, you get mad at her because she's innocent. And you get mad at her because she's she's trying to connect to you, but you know your mind is somewhere else, and you know it. There, I'll get into this in part three when we talk about sex and what's going on up here. So, uh, getting back to this whole thing called masturbation, I said all sex connects. And if you have a masturbation habit now, when you get married, you still have a masturbation habit. If you're married and have a masturbation habit, you need to break that thing. You need to get away, from, and you can do it. You can do it. It's not you can you can break that habit. There's DM me, uh, direct message me. Um, and then there's this thing called size. I, I can't get too involved in this right now because I'm running out of time. But there's this thing called size. And men have this thing that they're wrestling with now. It's called um, uh, penis envy. Penis envy. And where did they get that from? Why did, Why would they have such a thing as penis envy? I'll tell you why. It's because you've been exposed to so much porn and you're, you're, you're comparing yourself to other men. You're comparing yourself to these actors and, and whatnot. And you're saying, well, I don't have that kind of junk. And you begin to think that that's what it takes. You need that kind of junk to please a woman or your wife. You you bought into a lie. This is all in part three and four. I'll cover this. You bought into a lie. Let me tell you this right now. What God gave you is adequate. But let me put that in another way. Uh, God did not make a mistake when he gave you what he gave you. You think God made a mistake? This is not about size. If you understand, you know, anatomies and whatnot, you understand that her, her erogenous zone, her pleasure zones, they call it the G spot. It's like, like 
an inch uh, just inside of her uh, vagina. An inch, inch and a half just inside of her vagina. It's not about size. And, and if you're going to sit here and argue with me, oh, it's about size, all this other stuff, something's wrong with you. You're polluted. And, well, you don't know the women I met. Well, then she's polluted too. This, this has nothing to do with size. And you got guys wrestling with penis size now. I, I'm, I know what I'm talking about. We deal with these people in the brig. We have one guy who, who said, my wife said I have a small penis. And we have to address these issues. God didn't make a mistake when he gave you what he gave you. It's not about size. Your, your manhood is not measured by the size of your penis. It's just not. Your manhood is measured by your walk with God. Okay, female sexual organ. They have what's known as a vagina. And again, her, her, her it's directly related to identity and her con congratulations, it's a girl. Congratulations, it's a girl. How'd they figure that out? Because they looked at her genitals, that which produces, and said, it's a girl. Boom. They declare, pronounce, uh, uh, and proclaim over her right now. It's a girl. That's a de declaration of identity. That's an affirmation of identity. And it starts with the moment of birth. And then women are born with this thing called a hymen. I'm, I'm, I'm finding more and more young women today, 18, 30 years old, they don't know what a hymen is. They've never heard of what a hymen is. This used to be understood um, 20, 30 years ago. It used to be understood. We're losing this information. A hymen is a woman's seal of authenticity. It's a thin skin membrane covering of her vag uh, vaginal opening. It's a membrane mucus uh, kind of membrane-ish um, uh, covering. And so what ends up happening, women are born with this. Females are born with this. And uh, it has no biological function. Lower primates don't even have it. And so why did, what was God thinking? It's not an accident. What was God thinking? It's her seal of authenticity. If you study this out in Deuteronomy 22, 15, they were called the tokens of her virginity. What happened if, 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 you as a parent were raising a daughter, you were obligated to keep her pure and give her into marriage pure. And what happened the first night that she had sex, she got married, she had sex, and there was bloodshed on the sheets. The parents, this is in the Bible, the parents were obligated to take those sheets and put them away. That way, if anyone ever accused them of, of giving a daughter who was not clean or pure or whatever, the parents can bring those sheets out to the public for the court and say, these are the tokens of her virginity. This is proof of her virginity. And so there's that. Um, okay, here, here's, here's the, this, this is a touchy subject. You can handle it. You're big boys and girls. One of the things that happens when a man releases his semen inside a woman's vagina there's a stain, there's a marking, there's a tattooing, and more and more science is coming out proving this, that when a man releases himself uh, into a woman, that uh, he literally stains her vaginal walls. It's like a tattoo, and it's permanent, and her, his DNA remains in her for the rest of her life. They've got these, these experiments on flies and other small insects and whatnot, and they're proving that the DNA from the first fly, uh, you know, a couple generations later, is still present. I'm not talking about you know, hereditary stuff. I'm talking about sperm. And so uh, if you read Genesis 3.16, it talks about uh, after the fall. Let's go there real quick. Genesis 3.16. There's more to this than we realize. It says, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. And this is after the fall. And... Uh, to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Okay, so one of the things that happens, um, I've, I've shared this before, um, all sex connects, all sex connects. When a woman has sex with a man, there's a connection that occurs. Obviously it's physical, but it's so much more than physical. There's an emotional connection. I'll talk about that next week, emotional. And there's a spiritual connection. There's a marriage that occurs. And so um, it's, it's what ends up happening, a woman, if she slept with multiple partners, she becomes multi-married, she becomes multi-headed. 
because the man is the head of the woman. And so what ends up happening, it, it, this is kind of what it looks like. Let's say she had five sexual partners. Well, she's got, got A, B, C, D, and E. And then she finally meets Mr. Wright. This is the problem with this. I'm telling you right now. Um, what happened, she connected him in a deep way, but then that relationship went sour. And so she had to break up to get to here. Break up, break up, break up, break up, break up. So there was divorces that occurred between each one of these relationships. And so there's so much more that occurred. Right here, she was wide open. We used to call it in that relationship, that boy is in that relationship with his nose wide open. That means you gave it your all. You were, you were wide open. You were total abandonment. But what happens? You got hurt here. What happens to relationship B? You hold back a little bit because you, know, you you learn from the pain. You don't want to be hurt like that again. So you have reservations. You have suspicions. You have trust issues and so on and increasingly so on and increasingly so on, which means when you finally meet Mr. Right, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to connect with him on a deep level. I'll even take this to this. I know I'm still talking about stains and marks and all this, stuff, but this is referring to oxytocin. Um, there's this chemical released in our bodies. Men, men and women release this chemical called oxytocin. Women produce it in greater amounts than men. It's called the bonding chemical. Now, what happens, particularly when 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 a when a woman is is holding hands or kissing, uh, she produces oxytocin. It's like an endorphin. It's like a uh, it gets her gets her high. Men do it too, just smaller amounts. <clears throat> so what ends up happening when a woman is breastfeeding, um, um, she produces oxytocin which means it, it, something in her body enjoys the moment. And while she's breastfeeding, she's enjoying the moment. And it, it makes her want to do it again and again and again. So there's a strong bonding that's occurring between her and the child. It's, it's beautiful. It's natural. It's healthy. Well, it's proven that science has proven that from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship. As she goes on to the next relationship, she begins to produce less and less and less oxytocin, which means she finally met Mr. Wright. She's not producing healthy amounts of oxytocin, which means it's very difficult for her to connect with him. It's not impossible. It's just going to be difficult. And so, and, and, and speaking of breasts, you know, the Bible says in, in, in Proverbs, you read this, I think it's in 519, that uh, your wife's breasts are supposed to satisfy you all the days of your life. And and this is a good thing. And um, one of the things about breasts, I have, to, I have to throw this in here. One of the things about breasts is... Um, Breasts are very, very important. They're not just uh, utilities. They're, in the, they're beautiful and they're, they're functional, but they're also romantic. And, and he, here's part of the reason why. Um, God God is called El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And uh, some of the translations for El Shaddai is many-breasted one or all-sufficient one. El Shaddai means all-sufficient one or many-breasted one. And I gave that some thought. And I said, well, that just means God's got a lot of titties. Yeah, it's a joke. You know what I'm talking about. I'm just joking. But I, I, I try to imagine God with a lot of breasts. Now, why is this important? It's important when you understand the value and beauty of breasts. When a woman is breastfeeding, think about this. When a woman is breastfeeding, and, and, and well, actually, when a woman is lactating, that means she's producing milk to breastfeed. Science, medicine has proven that when a woman is lactating, in the middle of the night, she can hear her baby crying. Before she gets up, as she hears the baby crying, her breasts begin to produce in advance the milk to meet that baby's needs. It anticipates with the baby needs milk, and so her breasts begin to produce it, getting ready to deliver it. Now, she can be walking through the mall. If a woman is lactating, she can be walking through the mall and she can hear another baby crying. Something in her body is stimulated to begin producing more milk. It's not even her baby. And so the reason why I tell you this is because when I tell God is many best in one. Oh, oh I guess I got to share this. I almost forgot. There's this thing that women who are lactating they may go through. It's called being in, engorged. What that means is that her breast becomes so full of milk that it's painful to her that then she has to have some sort of relief. The baby may not be latching on properly or the baby's not eating. So they, we invented this thing called breast pumps to, to extract the milk manually. Well, um, I, God is called the many-breasted one for similar reasons. 
because a lot of times we're down here on this earth and we're crying out in pain and we're, we're requesting, you know, sending up petitions and, and prayers to the Lord. And he hears us crying. And I believe because it's called the many breasted one that he begins to produce what he, what, what he knows we need. And I, I can see us down here at times not able to latch on properly or even fighting him. And, and I think that to a large degree, God becomes engorged because he's, he cannot get the blessings to us, the healings to us, the truth to us that we're crying out for because we're being um, ignorantly resistant to it. And so it's difficult for God. And I think it's painful to God when he becomes engorged and he knows what we need. He produces what we need, but we're not in a position to receive it. I'm telling you, this goes back to Genesis 1, 24, 25 through 27. Be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. How can you have dominion when your sexuality is not intact? It'll destroy your ability to dominate. Getting back to the women um, staying and marking. Um, when a man releases himself, the, the semen is so powerful. I'm going to tell you this right now. The semen is so powerful that... that um, it, it stains and tattoos, it marks, and his DNA is res, will be resident in that woman's uh, uh, system uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, semen is so powerful that science is now calling it an antigen. I, I, I kid you not. Science is debating whether semen is an antigen or not. If gen is that which produces, antigen means that which is against what it produces, that which kills. And so they're, th they're, they're debating semen is an antigen. Now, the reason why they're calling it an antigen, you need to hear this, is because what they're doing, they're putting semen in the wrong places. And I know it's, it sounds a little crass, but I don't want you walking away, scratching your head. I wonder what he was talking about. You're going to know exactly what I was talking about. When I said there's only one place in the human anatomy where male semen is supposed to go, it's a woman's vagina because it can withstand it. It can take the power of that semen. It can receive it. If it's inserted anally, if it's ingested, I'm not talking about oral sex, I'm talking about ingestation. If it's ingested, if it's if deposited anally, it immediately begins to deteriorate and destroy because only the woman's vagina, a female vagina, is able to withstand the potency, the power, the, 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 the strength of that semen. And so now, because it's destroying rectums overwhelmingly in the homosexual community, and because it's being ingested and stomach ulcers and things like this, um, the science is saying, well, it's destroying. It's because you're putting it in the wrong places. We never had this problem before. And so there's that. Uh, I only have a few minutes left, so I got to skip forward some. There's this thing called kissing. I got to cover this. Where kissing is concerned, um, and, and you're dating, and a lot of people, because it's their anatomies and whatnot, where kissing is concerned, uh, I, I caution people about kissing these young couples that are dating and whatnot. I, I caution you about kissing. I understand, you know, you know, I'm I'm, I'm so puritanical and, and old school. I'm just letting you know a couple things. Number one, if you're kissing someone uh, uh, and she's not your wife, what right do you have to do that? Because what happens when that relationship breaks up and she goes finds another guy? You've already put your tongue down her throat. That, that doesn't sound about. That doesn't sound fair to me. That 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 that. that Hebrew kiss, that, that French kiss, that tongue kiss is reserved for a husband and a wife. See, you want the benefits without the sacrifice. And so I've had young kids come up to me, younger couples generally, they'll come up to me and say, well, it's just a kiss. It's just, it's not, it's no big deal. It's just a kiss. Um, you might fool yourself and you might fool a lot of people, but you ain't going to fool me because I'll ask them a simple question. And many of you have heard me say this before. I'll ask people, okay, young man, young woman, if you're telling me this is just a kiss, let me ask you something. Would you kiss your grandmother or your grandfather the same way you want to kiss that your boyfriend or girlfriend? Would you put your tongue down your grandmother's throat, young man? And young lady, would you let your grandfather tongue kiss you? Would you put your tongue in his mouth? And you should see him like almost throw up like, oh, yeah, 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 exactly. It's not just a kiss. You know it's not just a kiss. And the Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, be careful how you touch someone. Be careful how you touch someone. The man is not to touch a woman. What that literally means, again, be careful how you touch someone, euphemism, it means do not touch in a way as to start a fire. Look it up yourself. Do not touch someone in a way to start a fire. What's that kiss designed to do? This is the most erotic thing next to sex I think there is on this planet. It's not chocolate. It's not bungee jumping. 
It's not, you know, scuba diving and thrill sinking. No, I'd say number one is sex, and number two is a tongue kiss. And it's designed to prepare you, arouse you, and excite you for sex. All right, so um, there's so much more to this, and I just want to let you know as I wrap this up that uh, th th these classes that, that we have, man, th these are great classes. If you ever have opportunity to to hear me in a conference or and we do dialogue and, and we go back and forth, uh, these conversations go all kind of places. And God has prepared me to a large degree to answer these questions, and I love it. And uh, uh, so the conversations that we have with the prisoners, they're raw. They're clean. They're appropriate. But they're, they're real talk. And, I, and that, I, this is what I love about the prisoners. They're honest. And so uh, let me pray this over you, and I'll give you a little bit more here in just a second. So, Father, as we close, Lord, I thank you. I can pray over these people right now, and I and I pray over these men and women. I thank you that they know that everyone uh, runs in a race. There's a race, and everyone is running, it, Father, but only one person gets a prize. So I declare again that these men and women, they run to win, that they discipline. Uh, they're disciplined in their training. And, so, Father, they know that some uh, run to win a prize that will fade away, but these men and women run for that eternal prize. And these men and women run with purpose in every step. They're not shadow boxing. They do discipline their bodies like an athlete. They train their bodies to do what it should. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that they 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 they, they desire to possess their own vessels in sanctification and in honor. Father, that they want to uh, abstain from fornication. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that because they have not yet reached their goal and they are not perfect, but they have they know that Christ has taken hold of them, and so they keep on running and struggling to take hold of this prize. And Father, I thank you these men and women know that they haven't already arrived, but they forget what's behind them and they struggle for what is ahead. So I declare that they run towards that goal and that they can win the prize of being called to heaven. This is the prize that God offers because of what Christ Jesus has done for all of us. And so, Father, I thank you these men and women guard what God has entrusted to them. These men and women avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose them and their so-called knowledge. And Father, I thank you again. They know that there's a great cloud of witnesses who has gone on before them and they're surrounding them. And Father, so that because they set the example for us that these men and women lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles them and they run with endurance the race that is set before them and they fix their eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher and the perfecter of their faith. I pray these things in Jesus' name. So as I wrap this up, I want you to know that I'm, I'm doing um, Facebook Live sessions on Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays, all Japanese uh, standard time. Uh, Mondays at 7 p.m. Uh, Japanese time, Fridays at 9 a.m. Japanese time, and Saturdays at 6 p.m. Japanese time. And uh, um, the other thing is uh, the three S's. Uh, schedule, that was my schedule, subscribe and support. You can subscribe to a lot of this information. I have newsletters called Think on These Things uh, based on Philippians uh, four, and it says whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. Think on these things, um, and you can go subscribe at CNME. That's Christians in Actions Missions Organizations. CNME, C I N A M I dot O R G, CNME dot O R G, and look up the missionaries. Look Nick and Sandy up, and you'll see a place where you can subscribe to the newsletters. You want to get those? They're, they're popular, they're brief, and they're in your face. They're bottom line stuff. Um, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's called uh, Yahweh Has a Son. Yahweh Has a Son. There's, it's all together, one word. And then uh, the last thing is support. We do need your support uh, because of this virus thing. I understand giving has been down, but ministry hasn't stopped. Matter of fact, it's increased and people are afraid. People are crying out, looking for answers. And so um, we just need your help. It's expensive being over here in Japan. Uh, and, and we're 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 focused on the Lord's work. Uh, we're we're a ministry of integrity, and many of you know us. You know we have credibility. You know that we've gone to great lengths to 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 walk the straight and the narrow, and and be uh, transparent with everyone. And so, uh, if you can visit Christians in Action uh, Missions International, that's their my Christian uh, my missions organization, Christians in Action. They're out of Fresno, California. Uh, their website is uh, cinami org cinami.org that's c-i-n-a-m-i christians in action missions international love you guys and if you have comments thoughts throwbacks um in the comment section here go ahead 
share your thoughts and send your throwbacks. Throwbacks are things you want to include, questions you might have, whatever. Throw them at us, man. Love you guys. Um, praying for you guys. And I'll see many of you Saturday night right here. Love y'all. Bye.